Hello everyone. So let's jump into where we left off last time. We were talking about roots and we were talking about how this word roots often tells us about where we came from. Now, up to this point, we've been talking about exponents and exponents have been helping us with understanding repeated multiplication. It's almost like how multiplication talks about repeated addition just in a condensed form, exponents talk about repeated multiplication in a condensed form, and therefore they allow us to talk about incredibly large numbers in a very small amount of space, and we've discovered some rules that allow them to interact with each other. So now we don't have to kind of move backwards from exponents to the common ground of multiplication. We can work with the zero exponent rule. We can work with the product rule of multiplication of exponents that allow us to add the exponents together. We know that when you have an exponent and you raise it to another exponent, that that's going to be multiplication within the exponents because now you're talking about repeated groupings of this multiplication. So now we're gonna start talking about roots. And you can think about roots as being where do these repeated multiplications come from? Specifically, we can think about them in a geometric sense. So if I imagine, for example, that I have this cube, this Rubik's cube, and we try to count out how many cubes are in this Rubik's cube, it's not gonna take too long to realize that there are 27 of them. And you can just kind of go one at a time, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then realize that there's going to be that same repetition of those nine blocks at each of these three levels. So it's like we have three of these nines giving us 27 total blocks. Now, if I was to say that I had constructed this cube with reference to only one number, what do we think that number might be? Um, we might think that it would be nine there's there's nine on the top um but if i if i only had nine there i would need to be talking about some kind of some kind of area shape that i had used and stacked around possibly there's 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 something for that but then i might have pushed back and said how did you create that that shape of nine at the very top as well Remember that whenever we're talking about numbers and geometry, we want to be thinking about very old human uh, creations here, very old human discoveries. So when they were talking about numbers and size, area was not an immediate go-to. Length, however, was an immediate go-to. It was something that was much more easily measured and compared. For example, if I had a string uh, that had three units in it, possibly represented by having knots tied in the string, you could use that string to go and measure somebody else's string, and then you would both have a size of three units. And in this situation, that size of three units is all that we needed to have constructed this cube. So you can see right here that along this side, you're going to have three units and you can try to create a cube and then you can hold your string up to it and you can see that yes, in fact, that is the right size or maybe it's too large, too small and you can build up from there. And then that exact same length is going to help us in this direction to be able to help us get that initial area and then in this direction to help us extend that area into a three-dimensional shape. So the root of this cube is actually the number three. Now, when we write that using algebra and symbols, it's not immediately apparent, but that's exactly what we're trying to communicate with this model, is that if I had the cubed root or the root of this cube and I was looking for the origin of a 27 cube, we would say that that origin was with the number three, because with a length of three or with something the size of three, I could use that length to construct my cube. That's the, the most fundamental building block that we could use apart from one. And then of course we'd use the single block to be able to create a length of three. So when we're talking about cube roots, we're talking about what is the size of the string, what is the size of length that would work for this object. And we can also see that we can write this a little bit differently, right? When we talk about making a three cube, that was using the number three as a starting place for reference in a cube, and that was how we originally got 27. So we can think of these as inverses. Inverses meaning this doing and undoing, almost forwards and backwards uh, operation that allows us to move either to the, the answer of the question or back to the question itself from the answer. So let's now take a look at this next one.
The technical definition for the positive nth root of m is the principal nth root of m. And so all we mean by that is that when I write this, if we want to be perfectly technical, because eventually we will be talking about positive or negative roots, we'll get to that in a little bit, not right now, that if I am writing it without the plus or minus symbol, I am referring to the principal nth root, where in this situation it would be the principal third root or cubed root, we could say it. Now, could we construct a square that is 700 units large using rational numbers? This is an interesting question. So essentially what we're looking for is the root, the origin of this 700 square. Okay, so we're trying to figure out what number, we could maybe write this with symbols if we wanted to keep our, our thoughts straight, what number could I use and then square it, could I use and then create a square so that I would get a size of 700. And in our picture, that's going to be, I take that exact length, that's unknown, so I'm gonna call it X. I have an unknown length. I'm going to use it as my reference for all of my sides, and that's going to get me my X square, which we know is going to be of the size 700. Okay, well, we could maybe think about what are some some perfect square numbers that fit into this size. Let me, let me say, show you what I mean by that. We know that if I started with a length of two, that I could transform this into a square of size four square units. And I also know that I could start with three and I could take that and I could turn that into nine. I'm curious about what the largest number I could use in an attempt to get 700 would be. And after playing with these numbers a little bit, you're gonna settle on the fact that it's going to be uh, the number 10, okay? And here's, here's kind of how I see that. If I take the number 10 and I use it to create a square, that will get me something that is 100 units large, okay? So I have these 100 units of my seven. And so I could repeat this over and over again and see how many times I could fill up this square with, with these 100 units. So let, let's try to say that a little bit differently. If I have this, this 10 square, which I know fits into my 700, I can think about that by saying on one side, I know that I could make 10. And if I want to get a size of 700 on the inside, that would make the other side have to be 70. And that might feel a little bit weird. That's just that seven tens that we have all the way down here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven tens that we would be looking for. That's right, one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, perfect. And so on this one right here, this is my perfect square number. And it's like I have seven of those that are repeated all the way on down. Well, if you imagine cutting these out and trying to rearrange them, there's not a way that we could organize all of these into a square. Um, and if we tried it with, with some fraction numbers, we would actually have just as much difficulty, these, these rational numbers. Let me show you perhaps even a third way we could think about this one. And this one is the one that I'm gonna to promote to you uh, the most. So now let's go ahead and we're gonna try if we can clear off some space here. This is where when you're playing around with math, it just sometimes takes a little bit of playing until you really come to uh, an acceptable strategy. And, and so here's what we can do as we're trying to break the 700 down into its square components, into its square roots. Let's start with the number 700. Now we know that that 700 is going to result from multiplication, right? I have X times X, that gets me X squared, equal to 700. So I'm going to begin taking 700 and breaking it into its factors. And factoring, if you'll remember, is just our math version of saying division. So I'm essentially going to be trying to divide out whole numbers from here in order to find out what uh, what the components are, what I could possibly make the dimensions of this shape. So let's, let's begin to factor it out. Um, I know that 700 can definitely be divided by seven and that would leave 100 
left over. So seven times 100 gets me to 700. You can think of these factors as all being multiplied to get us back to the original because we're dividing out as we move down the factor tree. Okay, well, in order to divide out 100, uh, we could divide that out into 10 and 10, that would be our square number. Let's pretend that we didn't see that immediately and we wanted to factor into some other things. Maybe I saw before that, that I could make this into two and 50, and then from 50, maybe I saw I could make that into two and 25, and from 25, I thought I could go down to five and five. And I'm gonna stop here because this is a, a great place for us to kind of recalibrate because all of the numbers that I now have in my factor tree are prime numbers. What this says is that if I'm looking for the square root of 700, that I can think of this as being equal to the square root of seven times two, times two, times five, times five. And if you multiply all of those factors out again, you're going to get back to the 700. So nothing has changed in the meaning of my model here. But now what I can see is that I have a root for a two square, if I said, what's the root of this two square and what's the root of this five square, that would be two and five. So I can say that the root of two squared is simply two and the root of a five square is simply five. And that's going to leave that all I need to think about is this root of a seven square. In other words, the square root of 700 would be 10 root seven. Now this looks a little bit weird. This might feel like we've lost the geometric aspect of it. This might feel like we've kind of gone into just moving around symbols. Let me show you what this means in the picture. What we're talking about in the picture is that if I wanted to try to put 700 into its dimensions in a square, I would need to have on each side 10, I hope that's 10, 10 lengths of the square root of seven. And that if I did that all the way down, this would be my only attempt at being able to square root the number 700. Because as you go through here, if this is a size of root seven, and this one's a size of root seven, then when you multiply them together, you're going to get simply the number seven. You're gonna get a square that is seven units large. And so what you end up having is a whole lot of squares that are seven units large. And in fact, because you have 10 of them over here, 10 square roots of seven, and you have 10 square roots of seven, you're actually going to get 100 seven squares all the way through this. And that's where you can get back to your 700. So to answer the original question, can we represent this as a, a rational side? Can we represent this square root of 700 as a rational side? Uh, no, and the be reason being, if you try to square root the number seven, you're gonna see either in your calculator or if you try to play around with it, that there is not a fraction number that we can create that comes out to the square root of seven. The proof for this is a little bit difficult, um, but you can you can really quickly maybe kind of think back on something you might have heard in math class, which is that if you try to square root a prime number, that is impossible. And, and that kind of makes a little bit of sense, right? If you're trying to say, what is the, 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 the sides that I can multiply to get to a prime number, that makes no sense since prime numbers cannot be factored by whole numbers. The rationals, it's a little bit difficult for that, but I'm gonna kind of give you that one and let you play around with that for a little bit. So, moral of the story, if we're trying to find roots, we're trying to figure out what is the origin of these shapes. And maybe a nice way to think about that is to be pulling out the nice square numbers we can from the original uh, area that we're trying to manipulate, okay? Let's, let's keep that in mind and see if we can flesh out that idea as we continue to move along. All right. So now let's think of the nth root as an inverse. Remember that inverse means the undoing operation for whatever we're talking about. So we could talk about the additive inverse would be, how do I undo addition? And that's gonna spark in your mind that we're talking about subtraction. Okay, versus if I'm now talking about the inverse and I'm talking about roots as being an inverse, that would be for the exponential operation. So now instead of trying to repeatedly multiply, we're trying to ask the, answer the question, what did I repeatedly multiply in order to have gotten to this result? Okay, so now we have the cubed root of 127 equals a. 
Okay, then that, we could think of that as what is the number that would get me 1 over 27. Let's see if we can bounce out where exactly that came from. The idea being that over here, I'm saying, what is the origin, what is the root the, of the cube whose size is 1 over 27 units? Well, what that means is that I, I started with a length and I used it to make a cube, and the result of that cube was 1 over 27 units. That's what I've now written right over here. So I haven't changed the model, I've just changed my perspective in it. Well, what times itself, three times, a times a times a, is going to get us 1 over 27? Um, well, I could think of multiplying fractions, because I know that I'm probably going to start with a fraction to be able to get that fraction. Um, and I know that when I multiply fractions, what I multiply on the numerator stays on the numerator, and what I multiply on the denominator stays on the denominator. So what times itself three times gets me the number one. Well, that's gonna be pretty easy. That's gonna be the number one. So one times itself three times is going to be equal to the number one, great. What times itself three times gets me the number 27? And if you just start off and you try out a couple of the early prime numbers, like try it with two, try it with three, you're gonna see that three works out. So three times itself times itself is going to get us 27. So I can say that one third must be my A. In other words, one third is the cubed root of one over 27. Now it's at this point, after I clean up my work a little bit here, it's at this point that many of you might be trying to pull on some rules that we learned in high school algebra, and that's perfectly okay. But it's important that we understand where those rules came from. For example, is it okay for us to write this as the cubed root of one over the cubed root of 27. Now, don't make the mistake of calling this distribution. We aren't distributing. Distributing is a very technical math word that talks about when you have multiplication and how it interacts with addition. In this situation, we're essentially affecting the numerator and the denominator by the cubed root. And I'm asking you, is that something that we can do? Well, I would argue yes, because it's exactly what we did when we were logicking through this problem. We said we have a number times itself times itself, and that's going to get us to the number one. Well, that is then going to be the cubed root of one. That's what it means. That's we're talking about the origin of this cube. And then I said, well, if I've got the number one, we just need to think about what would be on the denominator to get us 27. And that's exactly what this expression is. So you do have the rule where if we are dealing with multiplication or division, and I say multiplication or division because fractions allow both, right? The numerator is our multiplication. The denominator is our division. When you're dealing with multiplication and division, you can think of having this exponent affect the different components and almost kind of... Um, it's tough to make sure you don't use the word distribute, but you want to make sure that you're you're uh, uh, affecting the multiplication and the division in the same way from that exponent. Okay, so now this is a moment where I'm going to go ahead and leave you to just make a guess. So make a guess. What numbers do you think are equivalent to the fourth root of 81? And this is an odd question because what's what is a what is a four dimensional shape? We don't need that anymore. We can think of our model of logic as being, I understand what a what a square is, I understand what a cube is. That's when I take something and I multiply it by itself either twice or by three times, and I could think of what would be the origin of a fourth shape, fourth degree square shape cube. I can think of saying, abstracting it out to what is the number that when multiplied by itself four times gets me 81 because that's something I absolutely could do on the paper and, and I could think of constructing these numbers in such a way. Okay, so think about that one for a moment. And then I'm gonna ask you to think about this one. What number times itself four times gets me negative 81? This one here, you wanna make sure that you don't jump to conclusions. Really try it out with some numbers and make sure that you're using this as an opportunity to practice. What happens, there's probably maybe gonna be a negative involved somewhere, or at least you should try saying what would happen if I started with a, a negative root, and then I used that and my exponents to build back up. 
Make sure you're keeping track of your negatives when you're multiplying them together. Make sure that you're not dropping any negatives and really add this into your notes. Let this be an inquiry-based learning. We have a good question. What would be the start number that would allow me, when I multiply it by itself four times, to get to the result of 81? Take a moment and think about that one. Now, when you finish with that question, we're going to begin to progress in the mathematics. And the idea being that now we've kind of had our play, we've had our conceptual, we've got some geometry to fall back on in case we forget any of our rules, but now we can start to develop the shortcuts. The logic makes sense to us, so we can move through it at a quicker pace without having to remember each and every individual step's detail. So here we are. Uh, to begin the discussion, there's some vocabulary that we're going to want to know. For example, the index, that's what we've been talking about as the nth root, that n, that number, regardless of what it is, 5, 8, 12, 13, n is going to be what we're going to call our index. And then our radicand is going to be the number we're referring to underneath the square root. So now when you begin to describe these problems to each other or to me, you don't want to be talking about uh, that number. That number isn't specific enough anymore. Is it the index or is it the radicand? So let's see if we can discover the rules. If the index is even and the radicand is negative, then perhaps there's a rule there. Well, let's, let's try it out with some numbers, get our, get our ideas flowing. If the index is even, let's think of some even numbers. Two, four, six, eight. Okay, so I've got even numbers and I'm putting them in the index. So let's go ahead and think of a couple of different examples then. We'll have the square root, we'll have the fourth root, we're gonna have possibly the eighth root, and we're gonna generalize that to a behavior. Okay, and the radicand is negative. Uh, let's think of some negative numbers, negative pi, uh, negative 384, uh, and possibly let's do negative 18. If I put those numbers underneath each of these radicals, right, the little square root symbol, but we don't want to say just square root, the little root symbol. If I put each of these numbers underneath, how is it going to work? Well, you should have already played with something like that, right? We just came from this even root of negative 81. So I'm going to leave that to you. What happened when you tried to find a number that multiplied to negative 81? Do you think that that would logically apply to other even indexes, indices, and the radicands that are negative? That's going to be the example that you put down here is your favorite way to kind of capture what the result is of trying to do an even root of a negative number. And then make sure that over here you write in what the rule is, a nice way to kind of remember this for the future. Can you do this? Can you not do this? Why? Okay, so here let's step in to expanding and simplifying. Now, when we're talking about expanding and simplifying, what we're really trying to do behind the scenes is just find more ways for us to relate to the mathematics. Simplifying allows us to recognize patterns and connections much more easily. So for example, we can think of uh, 500 and the number 1080 as both being groupings of two. And, and that sometimes helps us more simple, simply connect these unrelated numbers or unrelated patterns, similar to how we've been trying to connect squares with square numbers. Well, let's go ahead and expand this out and see what we can, what we can create. If A is a real number, okay, so that just means that it could be a lot of different things. It could be fraction numbers, it could be negative fraction numbers, it could be decimals, repeating decimals, not repeating decimals, pi, if A is a real number, uh, and if N is an even positive integer, then something, something happens. Okay, well, let's take a moment and see if we can put some numbers in. If A is a real number, for right now, let's, let's try negative pi. Maybe we'll start with a, a difficult number, and then we'll, we'll see if it would logically connect to easier numbers as well. Uh, and if n is a even positive integer, what's an even positive integer? Even would be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, uh, etc. Uh, positive would mean that I can't have it negative. Okay, so let's go ahead and say, um, let's do eighth root. Why not? So if n is an even positive integer, then the, let's now plug it in, almost like we're kind of doing a puzzle here. So we have the eighth root of, 
negative pi to the eighth. Okay, so we have negative pi to the eighth. Now take a moment and let's double check that this is actually the same meaning as what we just came from. What this says is find the origin of a shape that started from A. That's a way we can think about this. Okay, the way that I read the other one we have down here though is find the origin of a shape that we found from pi and then made opposite. Why did I read it that way? Because order of operations says that we do exponents and the meaning that goes along with exponents way before we take care of negatives, since negatives falls underneath the multiplication part of the order of operations. So this isn't quite right. We need to have negative pi be the origin. So let's make an adjustment here. Let's make negative pi, the entirety of negative pi, be the origin. Now this is much, much more uh, accurate to where we started. Okay. So we get negative pi to the eighth, and then we are eighth rooting it. Okay, so what that's going to mean, that means we have negative pi, and we're going to be multiplying it by negative pi, and we're going to be doing that uh, a bunch of times, and by a bunch I mean specifically eight times. Okay. And then I'm going to be undoing this repetition uh, over and over and over again. Okay. Um, well, let's think through this. If I do negative pi times negative pi, that would be a positive number so we've got negative times negative is a positive if i do that over and over again and i have an even number of times that we're doing that do we think the result is going to be a positive number or a negative number take a moment and think about that one for a moment now i'm going to say it's going to be a positive number so we've got a positive number and i'm just going to write that with a pound sign right here so we're going to we're going to create some kind of number I'm then going to take this positive number and I'm going to try to figure out where it came from. Well, this notation is the principal root. It's, it's asking what's the shape that we started or the length we started with to get this number as a result. Are we going to know that we're talking about a negative beginning, a negative origin? Well, for example, when I brought all the way up here when I was talking with you about where did 700 came, come from, no, no thought appeared in our mind about it possibly being a negative side length, specifically because we were talking about a shape, but also because of how we were reading this. This was the square root of 700. It just simply meant what two numbers multiplied by themselves gets me 700. And because there was no reference to the negative, we were talking only about the positive, the principal root. Okay, that one's a little bit hidden, but when we come down here and we say, I have a result of doing all of this repeated multiplication, and now I would like to figure out where that number came from, there is nothing that's going to spark in our mind that says that this needs to have come from a negative number. So in fact, when you do this, the answer you get would be just I. So essentially what we've done is we have lost the negative symbol throughout this operation, which might sound a little bit weird because in math, we're usually trying to preserve the meaning, but keep in mind that the meaning that it has written there is not necessarily the meaning that we want it to have. If I read this out, it says, find the origin of a shape that would have a positive area. And the immediate result in our mind then would be it would have to have a positive side length as well. That can appear a little bit weird, but for our purposes, what we can write down here instead is just that the number A, whatever the number A is, is always going to be made positive by this process. Well, we have notation for that, don't we? Absolute value of A. Again, to reiterate all of this, if we are trying to talk about this as far as side lengths, an area's origin that all this says is take a number, multiply it by itself repeatedly, and then pretend that if that was a shape, you were trying to figure out its original side length. That's always going to get us to a positive answer the way that that is phrased. If we wanted to include negative options, we're gonna learn later that we can add in that meaning to the original statement. But for right now, if you do an nth root of a to the n, and a is a real number, 
and n is an even positive integer, you're going to be left with the absolute value of a. So let's go ahead and take a look at this one for example. Sometimes numbers can help us out. So we're looking for the sixth root of the sixth degree exponent of negative three. Okay, but we can work from this the same way we would do order of operations, innermost parentheses first, and then slowly expand outwards. So this is going to be negative three times negative three, and then we're gonna have done this a total of six times. Okay. Well, if you go ahead and throw that in your calculator, you're going to get that, that is a very large positive number, right? So I'm going to leave that to you. Throw that into your calculator and get a very large positive number. Then try to do the sixth root of that very large positive number. Again, you're, you can almost kind of guess now based on our rule that we don't have to even use the calculator too much for that. We're trying to find the origin of a large positive shape. That's going to be some kind of positive side length. So the sixth root of quantity, using the parentheses quantity, negative three to the sixth is going to simply be positive three because of that meaning. So when we talk about this being an inverse, it is, but only a little bit. It's got us a, a little bit of a condition there in that I don't exactly always go back to where I started from, even though that's what we would think would happen. Okay. 